Okay, this really should have been a Halloween episode, but the thing is, this particular study came out right after the Halloween. Anyway, let's actually start this with a bit of an anecdote. Back when I was in early college, I actually had a chance to travel in Australia, and back then I was full of sense of adventure and wanted to actually see everything. But as you probably know, in Australia, well, pretty much everything can kind of kill you. I mean, Australians themselves are actually great, it's just the animal life is not particularly friendly. And so when I was exploring one of the local parks, I discovered that someone forgot to close a manhole. And because I was super curious, I wanted to see inside. When I looked in, it was super dark. And instead of just walking away from it, which I guess I should have done, I basically took a large rock and decided to toss it inside. And just a few seconds later, I ran away screaming in shock. Because first of all, I started hearing this bizarre hissing noise. And just a few seconds later, I saw what looked like tens, if not hundreds of these humongous Huntsman spiders suddenly running out of the hole, basically escaping the rock. And they literally spread away from the manhole in every single direction as I was running away from this. And honestly, I don't think I'll ever forget this, but this kind of taught me a lesson. First lesson being that in Australia I should probably not be so curious. And the second lesson here was that turns out that some spiders actually like to live together. Which is basically my segue into today's story. The story that's best described with the picture taken by the scientists who discovered all of this. This is a spider colony, with many, many spiders living together, creating essentially a kind of a spider city. And this is essentially what we're discussing today, but also the idea behind spiders being social and living together, because it is actually surprisingly rare, with many of these spiders now actually evolving because it seems to be a really successful strategy. Although I guess let's start with the obvious. Normally spiders are solitary, and they're obviously solitary assassins. A lot of them are territorial, a lot of them are very aggressive, and quite a few of them are prone to cannibalism. I mean, this is why we have black widows. Yet despite of this, scattered across the planet, there are very rare exceptions of species that have traded their solitude for group cooperation. And this is what we now refer to as social spiders. And surprisingly, in many cases, a lot of them build colossal communal structures and even hunt together as a kind of an army. But here the question is, so what does it take for a solitary killer that evolved to mostly survive alone to then become a harmonious member of a community? And what does modern science tell us about how these rare societies operate? Because today the idea of social spiders is a kind of a scientific enigma. Out of approximately 50,000 known species of spiders, social behavior is only found in approximately 0.1%. And while normally, at least based on the evidence, we associate this behavior with tropics. Locations with a lot of prey density and a lot of opportunities for communal living, where spiders tend to survive better in groups, and where many of them tend to live in groups of tens or even hundreds. But we now also have a lot of evidence of these communal or social spiders coming from Europe. And here's actually one such example, Rionides sclopiterius. This is a pretty common European spider that's known to aggregate in colonies of 60 to 200 individuals, building large interconnected webs in many locations in Central Europe. But I guess what's truly extraordinary is of course this very recent discovery that was completely accidental. This was reported in this study by East Van Urach and the team you see right here, and that's of course the picture you just saw. This was a discovery situated deep inside a cave which is why it's never really been seen before. And so here inside a sulfur cave located on the border of Albania and Greece, researchers discovered what's believed to be the world's largest colonial spider web, stretching over 100 square meters or approximately 1200 square feet, and the web that includes at least 110,000 individuals, all living in harmony in the same cave in complete darkness. And what makes this discovery even stranger is that this is not just one single species. This colony is formed by two species of the barn funnel weaver, the spider that's pretty common across Europe, with 69,000 individuals inside of this cave, and another spider referred to as Prionerigon vegans, which in this case represents 42,000 individuals. And neither one of these species was previously known to exhibit colonial behavior or to cooperate anywhere. So this is actually the first time these spiders have been seen living in any colony, not to mention the largest ever seen. And so in this case, this seems to be the result of what's known as facultative coloniality. Or in other words, they're living in a colony by choice. But all of this seems to be driven by some kind of a unique local condition. And so I guess the main question here is why or what exactly is happening? 
Well, it looks like here the resource fuel in this mega city is quite unique. The SCAF is unique because it has a sulfur-driven ecosystem, meaning that the food web starts not with the sunlight, but with a lot of chemotropic sulfur oxidizing bacteria, or microbes, that seem to form very dense white slimy biofilms all over the SCAF. And well, as it usually happens with a lot of these biofilms, they actually are pretty yummy for certain creatures. And in this case, this supports a huge population of all sorts of midges. Here we're talking about really tiny creatures that seem to survive by consuming this biofilm. And it's the cloud of these flies that then provide a lot of food for all of these spiders. So basically it's a very unique ecosystem where the spiders don't even have to do much because the food just comes to them directly and all they have to do is raise babies. And so in this case we actually have our first answer to the question of why even bother being social if you're a spider? And the answer here is, well, they're not truly social, they're basically quasi-social. They do share the web or the nest, and even cooperate in caring for their young, and possibly even share food, but this is only because there are so many resources and nobody has to compete, and there is a lack of additional pressure. Especially lack of any predators, or even any competitors for all of this food. But to be more exact, they're actually called quasi-social and not social, because unlike ants and unlike bees, they don't really have any specialized roles or castes, with all of these spiders basically being kind of equal. Any female in this case can reproduce and can lay eggs. But either way, this cooperative lifestyle still offers them quite a lot of benefits. First, there's a type of a collective defense and maintenance. By maintaining these massive silk structures, and by sharing this task together, this work overall reduces the amount of energy required on any single spider. And so instead of building one massive spider web, they just have to build a little bit, with additional generations just maintaining the structure over time. Although one of the biggest advantages is, of course, cooperative hunting. In this case, by working together, these colonies can easily capture a prey that sometimes may even be larger than the spider itself. Now, this doesn't seem to apply for these types of spiders, but in the tropics, colonial spiders are known to capture prey that's usually just as big or even bigger than themselves, with most of the prey captured on average being at least five times bigger than for any solitary spider. And so here a group of spiders, usually involving 30 to 50 individuals, can easily swarm a single sizable insect, taking it down together. And surprisingly, this is an extremely optimal strategy when it comes to nutrition. They don't spend as much energy or even as much poison and get quite a lot of nutrients back. But the reason why these cave spiders created such an enormous web is really just because they're in a perfect environment, dark, sulfur-rich environment, that produces a lot of flies they can then consume. Although in this study they also discovered that, in terms of genetic, the spiders living in this cave are actually slightly different from their surface relatives. And so in this case, the isolation seems to have already evolved these spiders to be something else. Moreover, the analysis of the gut microbiome from inside these spiders revealed a significant difference that was also kind of expected. The cave species exhibited a much lower bacterial diversity compared to the surface relatives, suggesting that they already became specialized to the very unique sulfur-based diet from this environment. And that's because a lot of those mites that end up eating all the bacteria do contain a lot of sulfur inside. And so here we have our critical lesson. Species that we thought we completely understood and that many people living in Europe probably seen in their house once or twice can still exhibit unexpected behavior and rapid adaptation when placed in some really extreme conditions, especially inside a dark sulfur cave. But that's of course our first discovery. Around the same time, or actually I guess several months ago, there was another intriguing study about social spiders, but this time coming from Australia. And specifically the study you see right here by Vanessa Pena Consalves that focuses on some of the social spiders living in Australia. But what makes this study intriguing is that the focus was not on behavior or even on how these spiders live, but on what's happening inside their brain. So here this was a test of what's known as social brain hypothesis. The hypothesis that generally predicts that managing complex social relationship requires a corresponding increase in brain size or capacity. And for this study, scientists actually performed a CT scan in order to analyze the brain. And so by using advanced imaging technology referred to as micro CT scanning and comparing the social spider brains to the solitary relatives, they focused their study on the Australian huntsman spiders, the same ones that I ran away from when I was younger, commonly referred to as Delina cancerides, 
along with the crab spiders they're referred to as Cysticus bimaculatus. Here's, by the way, the picture of one of these huntsman spiders. So yeah, imagine seeing like hundreds of these running super fast in every direction, with many of them headed toward you. That's basically my memory from like two decades ago. But I guess back to the study. So the overall finding was quite surprising. Social spiders did not have larger overall brains or central nervous system. So in terms of the overall brain size, they were very similar between the solitary and the social spiders. And that was the major challenge for that social brain hypothesis. However, when they looked closer, they realized that certain brain structures were indeed different. For the social huntsmen, they had a distinctly larger volumes for two parts of the brain, the arcuate bodies and the mushroom bodies, structures that are usually linked to the higher order cognitive processing and memory. And so these enlarged regions very likely support behavior that's vital for cooperation, such as for example recognizing group members and their friends, and also coordinating group activities. But surprisingly, there was also a discovery of a major trade-off. These brain studies revealed that the trade-off was the spider's poison, the venom gland. Many of these social huntsmen were found to have much smaller venom glands compared to their solitary cousins. And that's most likely because creating venom is not particularly efficient and is also metabolically expensive. And so here this reduction is interpreted as direct evidence for the evolutionary benefit of cooperation, because in this case each individual requires less energy and less venom in order to take down the prey. But that was for the huntsman spiders. The crab spider that was also studied as well surprisingly showed slightly different brain specializations. Unlike the huntsman, the cognitive centers were actually not different from solitary cousins, and instead they actually had much more sensitive visual processing. And in this case, this difference can be explained by their ecology. Social crab spiders usually live in very small family groups inside very dark leaf nests, and so their visual system has to be adapted to low light conditions and much darker environments. But I guess it still doesn't explain why other adaptations in these spiders are not present. I guess one guess here would be maybe because the huntsman spider used to be social for much longer, and so they adapted over time. Right now though, I guess we don't really know, so most of this is just going to be guesswork. But all of this still shows us something very important. It definitively shows us that cooperation in the animal kingdom is usually driven less by centralized intelligence and more by various specialized neural adaptation and sometimes certain evolutionary trade-offs, such as, for example, less venom. Which in this case also suggests that we are slowly moving away from the idea that brain size equals intelligence, because in this case, certain intelligence, such as social intelligence, seems to be mostly reflected in very specific brain regions and not the entire brain. Although here obviously we still have so much to learn. These are just some of the first studies and all of this is more or less recent discoveries. And so some of the future studies are going to try to focus more on counting individual neurons and possibly measuring the brain even more directly or possibly manipulating social environments in order to establish exactly what's happening here and how social life and social behavior in a lot of arthropods and insects can possibly change brain structure. And the reason why these studies are so interesting is because unlike social insects or obviously unlike mammals, social spiders are just so bizarre. They're not even supposed to be social, yet sometimes a lot of these spiders become very successful, not as solitary creatures, but by working together. And as the cave in Europe shows us, sometimes this goes to the extremes. 110,000 spiders in a single cave. And so definitely quite an exciting discovery, but we'll probably learn more about this in some of the future studies. And so until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM directly, or by joining your channel membership that grants you early access. You can also support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.